President Joe Biden met one on one with conservative Senator Joe Manchin in an effort to persuade the senator to support the three point five trillion dollar reconciliation bill. The very bill that unfortunately Senator Manchin has uh, been vociferously against uh, because of a host of ridiculous, hollow talking points, including that it's too expensive or that we need more bipartisanship. Now, unfortunately, even though uh, Manchin had already publicly rejected the bill, you know, Biden thought, maybe I can threaten Manchin with the bill that he actually does want passed, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which includes privatizing infrastructure, something that Manchin's donors want, and it also includes corporate handouts. Now, Axios has just reported that Biden bombs with Manchin, meaning that this one-on-one -on -one talk unfortunately, was not persuasive enough. The article goes on to claim that Axios was told Biden explained to Manchin his opposition could imperil the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill that's already passed in the Senate. Biden's analysis, though, did little to persuade Manchin to raise his top line. So what is his top line? I mean, that was something that has been in question, and it appears that Manchin is unwilling to spend anything above one to one point five trillion dollars, meaning that the three point five trillion dollar bipartisan, uh, the three point five trillion dollar reconciliation package is just far too expensive. We can't spend that kind of money. It's unacceptable. That's what we keep hearing from Manchin. And, you know, it it's frustrating because he's full of it. And I'll explain why in a second. But let me also just give you a side note in regard to the Axios piece in question here, because it doesn't help that the article was written by Hans Nichols, who just the other day published a laughable arg ar article arguing that uh, cinemas, Representative, I'm sorry, Senator, Senator Kirsten Cinema's rejection of that same bill had to do with the fact that, you know, she's just really responsible about the deficit and the debt. Uh, he wrote that while Senator Joe Manchin is getting attention for balking at a $3.5 trillion top line price tag, cinemas, he wrote this, accountant-like focus on the bottom line will be equally important to winning the votes of them and other key Democrats. Now, Biden also had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Cinema. It's unclear whether he was uh, more successful in persuading Cinema, but it is a little concerning that Manchin seemed a little unfazed uh, about the progressive lawmakers threatening to block the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Uh, it seemed like that was the area where progressives have some leverage. And to be clear, they should still use that leverage and call Manchin's bluff, because I guarantee you his donors absolutely do want the passage of that bipartisan bill. Now, um, in reality, if anyone's paying close attention, it's clear that Manchin is captured by corporate donors, of course, and this is important, his personal investments, which means he has serious conflicts of interest that typically go unreported in the mainstream press. Lawmakers like Manchin spew hollow talking points about the need for bipartisanship or how he's worried about the deficit as they announce their objections to legislation that would materially improve the lives of their own constituents. The media just accepts their talking points at face value. That's obviously not journalism, and it's certainly not helpful to the American people who deserve to know what really motivates these lawmakers. It took an accurate tweet from Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to get CNN's Dana Bash to finally ask Manchin the right questions. Earlier this week, Ocasio-Cortez responded to the West Virginia senator stating that he won't support the $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill because he's allegedly concerned about the price tag or because he's uh, captured by the corporate interests, not because he's actually worried about the price tag. Let's watch. I'm sure you've heard uh, your fellow Democrat, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, said this about you in a tweet. Manchin has weekly huddles with Exxon and is one of many senators who gives lobbyists their pen to write so-called bipartisan fossil fuels bills. It's killing people sick of this bipartisan corruption that masquerades as clear-eyed moderation. That's this is your fellow Democrat. Well, well, is it true that you have weekly meetings with Exxon not. and other absolutely lobbyists not. for fossil fuel? Ever, no, they don't. Weekly meetings? I don't. It's just false. I, I keep my door open for everybody. It's totally false. And those type of superlatives, it's just awful. 
continue to divide, divide, divide. I don't know the young lady that well. I really don't. I've met her one time, I think, between sets here, but that's it. So we have not had any conversations. She's just speculating and saying things because she wants to. She's not the only one. I'm sure you've heard. There are a number of your fellow Democrats who say that you're opposed to this because you're I'm bought and paid for by I'm opposed corporate to it because donors. It makes no sense at all. Got to be honest, I love watching Joe Manchin squirm. And before we disprove him, before we uh, call out his lies, it's important to look into uh, why he rejects the budget reconciliation bill in the first place, what he has cited as problematic. He is not in any way in favor of the climate action provisions uh, that certainly don't go far enough in responding to the climate emergency, but do happen to be the most robust way the United States has proposed to uh, mitigate climate change. Now, there are also provisions uh, that would help American families, provisions that include, for instance, free two-year community college, uh, an expansion of Medicare to include dental, vision, you know, things that should already be included as part of healthcare, to be quite honest with you. It would also lower the age of Medicare. It would allow for Medicare to negotiate for, for drug prices directly with pharmaceutical companies, uh, essentially lowering drug prices and saving money, not just for the federal government, for the but for the American people. Um, it also includes child care. It includes all sorts of provisions that would make Americans whole or at least as close to whole as possible in this hyper-capitalist system. Let's keep it real. Uh, and so Manchin knows that it's widely, wildly popular with his own constituents, uh, but he keeps claiming over and over again that his problem is, well, I'm worried about jobs. I mean, it, the climate action could lead to job losses in West Virginia. He claims he's worried about the national debt. Uh, but the bill would also offer uh, the provisions to help struggling American families, which goons over at Fox News seems seem to think wouldn't even appeal to Americans. Now, look, just to give you a sense of how popular these provisions are, Stuart Varney over at Fox Business did a segment to talk about what the provisions included. And he got a lot of backlash because it turns out that his own audience members think that these provisions sound really, really good. Let's watch. If Bernie Sanders gets his way, America will look, feel and perform just like Europe. He and his fellow leftists want to spend five trillion dollars to put the federal government in charge of your life, literally from cradle to grave. In Bernie's world, let me outline your life. Before and after birth, parents get paid family leave. Up to age three, the government helps with daycare. After age three, youngsters get free pre-K. Parents get cash for their kids all the way through age 18. Cash for kids. After high school, two years of free community college. And you, the parents, get expanded Medicare with dental, vision and hearing paid for. Now, to be fair, Stuart Varney actually did a better job explaining the provisions in the bill than I've seen in other uh, cable news shows, which is fascinating because, again, Varney was under the assumption that his audience would hate the reconciliation bill. But upward of 70 percent of American voters, and that includes Republicans, support the provisions in the budget reconciliation bill. So it's understandable why Varney would get uh, backlash from his own audience members. Now, going back to Manchin and his response to Representative Ocasio-Cortez and how he claims that he does not meet with executives or lobbyists from Exxon, um, it's really hard to buy that argument when earlier this year, a senior Exxon lobbyist by the name of Keith McCoy was tricked by activists posing as job recruiters uh, during this uh, secretly recorded meeting. Uh, he thought, of course, he was being interviewed for a potential job, but he ended up admitting on camera that he does, in fact, meet with Manchin in his office or at his office every week. Let's watch. Senators pressed to do Exxon's bidding behind closed doors. You want to be able to go to the chief. Yeah. And so the chief knows you, that you can go to the chief and say, look, we, we've got this issue. Yeah. Uh, we need Congressman so-and-so to be able yeah. to either introduce this bill. We need him to make a floor statement. We need him to send a letter. Yeah. You name it. We've asked for everything. So who are the fish? 
I'm Joe Manchin. I approve this ad because I'll the biggest catch, according to Mr. Coy, is the Conservative Democrat Senator Joe Manchin, who famously shot President Obama's cap and trade climate bill. And I'll take dead aim at the cap and trade bill. Joe Manchin, I talk to his office every week. Um, he is the kingmaker, uh, and, and he's not shy about sort of staking his claim early yeah. and completely changing the debate. Oh, he's the kingmaker. Meets with uh, Joe Manchin's office every week, but apparently Joe Manchin uh, is clueless about that. I don't know. Is he like sedated when that meeting happens? And, uh, you know, there's also quite a bit of reporting um, from sources like Open Secrets uh, that indicate that Manchin has taken quite a bit of funding from ExxonMobil, which, of course, has no interest in passing the budget reconciliation bill, knowing that the climate provisions would hurt their bottom line. So analysis of campaign disclosures found the six Democratic senators, Mark Kelly, Maggie Hassan, Joe Manchin, Chris Coons, Kirsten Sinema and John Tester, received a combined total of nearly $333,000 from lobbyists, political action committees, and lobbying firms affiliated with Exxon over the past decade. And look, despite the overwhelming evidence that Manchin is beholden to his corporate donors, that he's basically captured by them, in interview after interview, if he's ever asked about it, he pretends like he's completely clueless. I bring you this exchange between Jake Uger and Joe Manchin back in 2017. I thought it was a great interview, but get a load of how Manchin responded to the accusations of legalized bribery. Well, you voted to repeal the stream protection rule. Um, and your top donor is First Energy uh, that wound up getting in some degree of trouble for uh, putting arsenic in a pond. It seems like they would benefit from the repeal of that regulation. So did that have anything to do with your vote? No, Jenks, I know it's hard to believe and I know it's hard for people to, I don't have any idea who gives me money. I don't solicit from the standpoint, you do this for me, quit pro quo, that's never been me. That's not my political mantra at all. This is the list of your top donors. I, I, I thought you said that you don't, I understand that you said you don't do quid pro quo, that, that was clear. Yeah. But you know who your top donors are, right? I do not. You don't know who your top donors are? I do not, you're showing me something I've never seen. Okay, so this is from Open Secrets. Have, I know you have, Jenks, I know that it's hard for anyone to, to believe, I do not. Yeah, notice there are quite a few energy companies uh, listed as his top donors. And one of the reasons why it's so hard to believe that Manchin um, has no idea about his corporate donors is due to reporting by The Intercept earlier this year, when reporters like Ryan Grimm and Lee Fong obtained audio of Manchin's meeting with the billionaire donors behind the group known as No Labels. At the time, members of his own party were fighting to end the Senate filibuster, which requires 60 senators senators to vote in favor of legislation in order for anything to pass. Now, that's the reason why legislation typically goes to the Senate to die. But Manchin kept fighting over and over again to maintain the filibuster. And his main argument was, we need to maintain it because bipartisanship is important. We need to reach across the aisle. We need to show that we can unite the country. Now, with uh, the stimulus bill or the coronavirus relief bill that was passed during the Biden administration, that really showed that the GOP had no interest in working together. They had no interest in bipartisanship. In fact, Manchin said we need to maintain the filibuster and just negotiate with the GOP. He did a bunch of concessions on behalf of the GOP, including uh, additional means testing for the relief. He also was able to cut down the unemployment insurance from uh, $400 a week to $300 a week in the middle of a pandemic. And the whole idea was we don't have to get rid of the filibuster. We can pass this in a bipartisan way. Everything's going to be great, except they weren't able to pass it in a bipartisan way. Um, not a single GOP lawmaker voted in favor of it. 
Now, when he was meeting with those billionaire donors from No Labels, he realized, mm, my talking point on bipartisanship is not going so well, so I need your help. Manchin told the assembled donors that he needed help flipping a handful of Republicans from no to yes on the January 6th commission in order to strip the far left of their best argument against the filibuster. The senator even suggested enticing his right wing colleague, Roy Blunt, who's retiring with a job offer after he leaves public office, telling the big money donors, quote, Roy is retiring. If some of you all who might be working with Roy in his next life could tell him that'd be nice and it would help our country. That would be a very that would be very good to get him to change his vote. And we're going to have another vote on this thing, meaning the January 6th commission. That'll give me one more shot at it. So understand that he wasn't trying to entice Republican lawmakers to vote in favor of economic policy that would improve people's lives. He was specifically trying to get these billionaire donors to offer Roy Blunt a job as soon as he's out of public office in return for a yes vote on the January 6th commission, just to give the American people the illusion of bipartisanship in the Senate. Now, the reconciliation bill uh, would raise taxes on the wealthy and corporations, which is a major reason why his corporate donors are against it. But the media tends to leave out that fact from their coverage. And they also tend to leave out the fact that Manchin himself is a business owner. He is a millionaire in his own right. Um, and he's worried about his own profit motives. Manchin himself is a millionaire who would end up paying more in taxes if the reconciliation bill would pass with tax increases on those making $400,000 or more per year. Also, while Manchin claims to be concerned about jobs in the fossil fuel industry, it's more likely he's really just looking to maximize his personal returns on his investments. So uh, I take you to Robert Reich, who writes that Joe Manchin founded two coal companies in the 1980s, which are now led by his son. His family's fortune relies on allowing the fossil fuel industry to keep wreaking havoc on our planet. Also, this is super relevant, Manchin's most recent financial disclosure shows that he has made nearly half a million dollars a year or last year due to his personal investment in the coal industry. According to his most recent financial disclosure, Manchin gained $492,000 last year due to his non-public shares in a coal company called Ener Systems, which records or which records show is a contractor for a power plant in the state's north that burns waste coal. Meanwhile, Manchin's 2020 income for being a senator was $174,000. That's relevant because it shows that his investments in coal more uh, bring him money that's more than double his salary uh, for being a senator. So uh, then there are other conflicts of interest that are worth mentioning. For instance, Manchin objected to increasing the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour, arguing that $11 an hour is just far more reasonable. What was left out of the corporate media coverage of that debate was the fact that Manchin is a stakeholder in a company that owns a hotel in West Virginia, which would be forced to pay its workers a higher wage, thus cutting into their profits. As TYT Investigates reported back in March, uh, AA property is reportedly 50% controlled by Manchin and is an investor in Emerald Coast Realty, which owns a La Quinta Hotel in Elkview, West Virginia. The national average salary for several La Quinta positions is well below $15 an hour. If Manchin's $11 an hour proposal were to win out, which it didn't, there was no increase in the federal uh, minimum wage, La Quinta hotel housekeepers, for instance, would get an average wage of $0.08 cents an hour nationwide. Uh, but uh, it would have far more of an impact on the workers uh, in West Virginia, where they're paid far less. Now, again, uh, paying those workers would cut into the return on Manchin's investment. That is a huge issue. 
How do we allow lawmakers to have these personal business investments when they're supposed to be passing policies based on the best interests of their constituents, not based on the best interests of their pocketbooks? Instead of emphasizing this clear conflict of interest or even mentioning it at all, the media continued to bolster Manchin's claim that Democrats need to tone down their demands in order to appeal to GOP lawmakers. But not a single Republican lawmaker in the Senate or the House, as I mentioned earlier, voted in favor of the COVID relief bill. Uh, all they've been interested in is stripping down proposed legislation coming from the Biden administration. And by the way, the media also ignored Manchin assuring the powerful lobbying group known as the National Restaurant Association, that he was committed, committed to blocking the wage increase. We've been having meetings on minimum wage, and I can't for the life of me don't understand why they don't take a win on $11. But Bernie Sanders is totally committed in his heart and soul that 15 is the way to go. Well, it might be the way to go, Bernie, but it ain't going to go. You don't have the votes for it. It's not going to happen. So they're going to walk away with their pride saying we fought for 15, got nothing. And I said, we could start down the path, $11, take care of tip wage, because that's very important in your industry that we're talking about to make sure that it won't get that out of kilter and mess up the whole industry. So I can tell you there's more than just me as a Democrat that believes that uh, the path they're going down is wrong. But if it comes down to one person, I don't believe it should be above 11. I don't think tip wage should ever go above half of that. Uh, from your lips to God, God's ears. Yeah, that was pretty disgusting. And honestly, that's just another one of his hollow talking points, that raising the federal minimum wage would actually hurt workers because businesses would have no choice but to shut down or to cut jobs. But let's really take a look at how much Joe Manchin is concerned about job losses, even in his own state of West Virginia. It's especially rich considering Manchin's unwillingness to step in as more than 1,400 workers, unionized workers, in West Virginia lost their jobs over the closure of the Viatris pharmaceutical plant in Morgantown. The jobs were offshored to India and Australia, which sounds like a really great idea, just as we're experiencing how fragile our supply chains are in the middle of a pandemic. Now, as Democracy Now! reported back in July of this year, Viatris was formed through a merger between two pharmaceutical companies, Mylan and Upjohn. Mylan's chief executive, Manchin's daughter, Heather Bresch, got a $31 million payout as a result of the corporate consolidation before the new company set about cutting costs, including the closure of the Morgantown plant. The fact that Manchin's daughter received a massive golden parachute over the merger likely played a role in the senator's unwillingness to do a damn thing to prevent the loss of thousands of unionized jobs in his own state. So the president of the United Steelworkers of America, Local 8975, uh, and a worker at the plant says that Viatris has given little reason for the closure except to say that the company is looking to maximize the best interests of the shareholders. Because, of course, understandably, it was unsurprising when the union represent, uh, representing the workers at the time reached out to Joe Manchin, reached out to his office, and all they got was the cold shoulder. The union president stated that Joe Manchin gave the union members two minutes of his time several months ago and has not done anything meaningful on their behalf. In fact, Manchin's apathy toward these workers was pretty brazen. The majority of penicillin and such is made outside of the domestic United States of America. But Joe Manchin's first question to us was, and I was on the call with four other officers at the union hall at the same time, are you all still making penicillin at the facility? We haven't made penicillin in Morgantown, West Virginia for more than 20 years. So all of this context, all of these conflicts of interest, it goes beyond legalized bribery and corruption. It has to do with the personal material interests of our lawmakers. Those are the things that 
fuel their decisions, the way they govern, the way they legislate, and what type of legislation they're willing to even propose as they allegedly represent the very people who elected them into office in the first place. The fact that our lawmakers are able to be invested in individual stocks is already a massive conflict of interest that never gets addressed. And during the pandemic, it became very clear that members of Congress are trading off of insider information that they receive during undisclosed briefings about things like the pandemic, for instance. So we are supposed to live in a democracy where we vote for lawmakers who campaign on things that we care about, things that would improve our lives. But one of the main reasons why they don't actually carry out our interests is because of their own material interests that get completely ignored in the press. They need to be banned from being able to invest in public, I'm sorry, in individual stocks. They should not be able to have a little side hustle or side business that would clearly serve as a conflict of interest. And I just want to remind you all that during the Trump administration, rightfully, there was a lot of coverage about his conflicts of interest, about his violations of the emoluments clause of our constitution, because he's a businessman and that could really be harmful if we have a president who's looking out for his own business as opposed to the best interests of the American people. But when it comes to congressional lawmakers who engage in similar behavior, all we get from corporate media is stenography essentially claims uh, that they, they're worried about bipartisanship, they're worried about uniting the country, they're worried about the debt or the deficit. Are they really issues that they're concerned about? And why is it that we have journalists that are just regurgitating what lawmakers are saying them, saying to them instead of questioning what their real interests are? So, you know, democracy is undermined both by the legalized bribery, but more importantly, by the fact that you have lawmakers looking out for their bottom line. And it's something that needs to be acknowledged and something that needs to be legislated against. Nando. I often think of the media as their main role to obfuscate real power and how power is exercised in this country. Um, this is especially true of the liberal media, uh, which, you know, elevates everything to, like you said, like these kind of lofty concerns over bipartisanship or or whatever, you know, uh, fiscal responsibility or whatever, like as if anyone actually believes in any of that stuff. It's it it it. And the thing is, like, they may believe it on some level, like, mm -hmm. but it, it is because of a foundation of power relations um you know as mark said it's the base and the superstructure you know not to get all you know not to get all kale brooks on 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 you but uh the uh it, it's it's and and what the media does is ignore the base like or or purposefully obfuscate the base um and only talk about the 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 sort of uh the sort of high high level ideas or whatever. Um, I mean, this is why a lot of people, like a lot of people on the left, enjoy reading the Financial Times because the Financial Times is often, you know, in the context of the mainstream press, um, doesn't doesn't engage in that. You know, they do engage in actual kind of power relations. Um, they just thought they just are on the other team. Um, but uh, but it it is clarifying to read it because you can you can see how how power actually works. Whereas, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's just, it's so frustrating to see it because, um, again, it doesn't matter. And, and the thing is, it doesn't matter what's inside someone's heart, you know, like it really doesn't. Exactly. Uh, yep. It, and you can go crazy trying to figure it out. I mean, I mean, it, it is a fun kind of like debate to be had on a Friday night when you're amongst your friends and you've had a few drinks and you're just like, so these Democrats, do you think that they're just like stupid or do you think they're liars or do you think they're and it's like there's a combination no. of both. And, you know, and you, I think you'll they're rational really actors. Know. I think they're rational actors. Yeah. And I think that they do what's best for them as long as the system allows for it and the system allows for it. Right. Like, yeah. They might be called public servants, but they're not really interested in serving the public. And it's not about them being good guys or bad guys. It's about material interests, right? Like yeah. this, like the media's tendency yeah. to treat congressional lawmakers as if like, you know, they're above all of that. 
like, you know, that they're not in any way greedy or looking, you know, looking out for their own, you know, financial uh, interests is ridiculous. Uh, they're rational actors at the end of the day. And you're right. Like the power structure is what needs to be focused on and, and what the real incentives are. And I just think that gets completely yeah. ignored. Yeah. In the mainstream conversation. And just the, the, the level of corruption is just so, it's so disgusting. It's so disgusting. Like the, the American state is just, is just like so corrupt. Um, totally, yeah. it's, uh, you know, it, again, I, I, you know, it's like corruption happens almost everywhere and, you know, there's, there's limits to, to like anti-corruption politics and all that stuff. But, but the, the, the American state is just so utterly corrupt it's just it's crazy like if you just stop and look at it for five seconds you're like this is so disgusting i mean and the thing is like yep. it's funny because americans have this view of history that is kind of like if it happened in the past like if it happened more than like 15 years ago it's like it's like it, it's in the past like it's way in the past so like everyone kind of understands very well that that cities like New York City and the turn of the century with uh, uh, the Tammany Hall machine and, you know, and that Chicago local politics was like dominated by the mafia. And like, they understand like that in history, but like, they don't see the current, you know, the current thing as kind of a version of that, or like maybe a, a slightly yeah. more polite version of that, but it's really the same, the same thing. Well, I mean, the Supreme Court carried out exactly what uh, corporate interests wanted it to carry out. I think the reason why uh, the corruption is seen differently now is because it's given this like facade of, you know, I guess the credibility of like legality, right? Like it's like, oh, yeah. but it's, you know, Supreme Court said this is OK. This is just political speech. It's totally fine. Totally OK. And I. I the other thing that drives me crazy is that it's it becomes just like another part of like the horse race uh, analysis of of politics that you know places like Politico do. It's like who's winning the money race, <laughs> you know, like um, yeah. like in any election, it's like it's just another data point in to to judge who wins the horse race. Not as like some, it's not like wait, this is disgusting. Like the fact that this is like it's it just becomes like another just like oh you know like this person's up a few million dollars and the other one has lots yeah. of catch up, catching up to do they might have to you know and it's it that 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 whole thing is just it's just it's like well. it's like them announcing I, I don't know like some athlete stats as if it's a good thing right like the person yeah. who raises the most money is the person who's winning so you know there's that extra layer of um doing positive pr for the legalized bribery yeah. that happens in this if you enjoyed this video from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. That way, you'll enjoy all of our backlog, as well as all of our future content, including interviews, live streams, and clips. Thank you.